1991. The penultimate European Cup before the reformation into the Champions League. A shock akin to Leicester City winning the Premier League, as Red Star Belgrade of then Yugoslavia beat Marseille in Bari, Italy, 5-3 on penalties in the final after a 0-0 draw. Hello, and welcome to The Whole 18 Yards, a new channel intended to educate modern football fans on past teams, players and innovations. Whilst a lot of people may know these sides, the intention is to deep dive on these topics so as to hopefully not let these pivotal moments in football history be banished to distant memory. As we're in our infancy, it would be greatly appreciated if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel so that you can be informed of new releases and help us grow. In 1991, Red Star Belgrade found themselves in a very different atmosphere than they do now. This was before the breakup of Yugoslavia and subsequent further inclusion of Eastern European sides in the sphere of influence of the bigger European sides. Pioneering tactical devices were implemented throughout Eastern Europe during the 70s and 80s, and Red Star Belgrade's continental success was the pinnacle and final hurrah of roughly two decades of success. From Emmerich Genai of Stauer Bucharest to Kiev's Valery Lobanovsky, followed by Red Star's very own Lyubko Petrovic, this generation's most exciting coaches were not Spanish or German, they were from the communist hotbeds of Eastern Europe. Bolshevik pre-revolutionary culture was very geared towards social sports clubs being accessible only to the upper echelons of society, whereas the rest of the population was inspired by muscular Christianity. As a result, Russia and its extended influence on Eastern Europe placed significant importance on physical health, strength and hygiene. This importance was demonstrated with the USSR finishing top of the medals tables at six of their nine Olympic Games. However, once revolution hit and the Communist Party took over, the segregated gatekeeping of sporting facilities was ended and a new system was introduced, the State Sports Committee of the USSR. This committee was formed in June 1936. Physical culture, the disciplining and training of the socialist body, home to the socialist mind, was the popular movement of the decade. This ideology transferred neatly into the post-war semi-professional football world. Athletes from all over the USSR were hand-picked by their local clubs, many with state and army ownership, and the best facilities of their day were made available to them. Whilst Yugoslavia had split away from the USSR by 1948 due to the conflict between Stalin and Tito, Round one, fight! there was still a shared sporting ideology between these two socialist states from the Eastern Bloc. And whilst the USSR continued to focus on more track and field style events, Yugoslavia and surrounding satellite states were much more heavily influenced by their Central European neighbours by placing a growing value on the sport of football. Our first stop in recognising the progress of post-Soviet Yugoslavia in the world of football is the magic dragon himself, Dragan Zajic. Zajic made his debut at left-back for Red Star Belgrade at the tender age of 16 incredibly young for 1962, but quickly progressed up the field due to his technical proficiency. 370 goals in 615 games later, and Zajic cemented his place in the pantheon of Yugoslavian football greats. So why, unless you're likely Serbian or over the age of 40, have you not heard of him? The Iron Curtain Eastern European countries at the time were hardly enthusiastic about sharing their secrets with the West, and in return, the West weren't particularly interested in hearing about what was going on behind the Iron Curtain either. The 22-year-old left-winger tore world champions England apart in a 1-0 semi-final victory in the European Championship. English newspapers were in awe and nicknamed him the Magic Dragon. Despite scoring in the final, the match was drawn and Yugoslavia lost the replay to give Italy the title. But the world had sat up and taken notice even if they knew they wouldn't see anything from him until the next international tournament. That year, Zajic finished third to George Best and Bobby Charlton in the Ballon d'Or, a decision Franz Beckenbauer publicly disagreed with, stating that the Yugoslavian wonder should have won the coveted honour. The man of many, many opinions, Pele, also had his say. Zajic is the Balkan miracle, a real wizard, I'm just sorry he's not Brazilian, because I've never seen such a natural footballer. 
Another solid take on Zajic's legacy comes from long ball football. Zajic was one of the most complete wingers ever, but never gets the adulation or praise he deserves because of his decision to stay in the obscurity of the Yugoslav League. If he was a Spaniard, Brazilian or Argentinian, he would be placed on a pedestal and hailed as one of the greats. Instead, we have to be content with looking back at his career in video form and wonder what could have been if he played elsewhere. So, why am I talking about a player from the 1960s when talking about a team from 1991? Well, one, context is key. That's literally what this channel is about. Two, he shone a light on Yuka's love football and became the first idol for the next generations of football in the country. And three, his legacy. Immediately after his retirement in 1978, at the young age of 32, Zajic made the move to the boardroom and was appointed technical director of Red Star Belgrade. The following season, the club managed to reach the UEFA Cup final, which was the considerably more prestigious predecessor to the Europa League, losing out to Borussia Mönchengladbach after knocking out Arsenal and Cyril Regis's West Brom side along the way. What followed was par for the course for a club of Red Star Belgrade standing, with domestic titles in 1980, 1981 and 1984. Managers came and went, but one constant on the footballing side was the position of Zajic as technical director. In a time when most clubs didn't even have a specialist fitness coach, the model of having a man on the board be responsible for shaping the club's playing staff through acquisitions away from the job of coaching the team was revolutionary at best. Goiko Zetsch had done a solid job of coaching the side, ending his tenure with a quarter-final defeat to Atletico Madrid in the Cup Winners' Cup of 1986. But Zajic met with the board of Red Star to initiate a five-year plan to move from this moderate success to giving the club the best chance possible to win a major European honour. Vela Vasovic was brought in as coach, a sweeper in the Beckenbauer mould, who was in the 1966 Partizan Belgrade team that made the European Cup final after the Munich air crash. Following a short spell with Red Star as a player, he went on to be a huge success at Ajax, winning the European Cup with them in 1971. Along with a new coach, two key players were brought in. First was Borislav Svetkovic, a Croatian forward from league rivals Dynamo Zagreb. Second was the majestic pixie, Dragan Stojkovic. It would only take one year for the project to bring its first major silverware, as a new look, young Red Star Belgrade won the Yugoslav title in 1988. A 22-year-old Stojkovic starred and ultimately ended up with 57 goals in 184 appearances from midfield. But wait a minute. Breaking news. Yugoslavia win the 1987 FIFA World Youth Championship in Chile. So, Zajic's five-year plan that was lauded earlier as revolutionary seems rather opportunistic now. Even though only a handful of the players from this youth squad were on Red Star Belgrade's books, it was painfully obvious that there was a golden generation appearing at youth level, spread evenly throughout the biggest clubs in Yugoslavia. Boban, Shuka, Prozhnetsky, Miatovic, Stimak, and Yani, all players spread across core central positions who went on to become either superstars or household names later on in their careers, all either 18 or 19 years old and already proving themselves as winners. And here is where we focus on Red Star's golden boy, Robert Prozhnetsky. Prozhnetsky was a precocious talent, born in West Germany to Yugoslav parents but moved to modern-day Croatia by the age of 10. After the move, he immediately joined the youth setup of Dynamo Zagreb. The season before the World Youth Championship, he started getting handed first-team opportunities, making two appearances and scoring one goal before the end of the season. During the off-season, his father, acting as his agent, was determined to reach financial security for his son by negotiating a professional deal for him. However, Dynamo coach Miroslav Blazovic would have his you-won't-win-anything-with-kids moment by saying he would eat his coaching diploma 
if Prosnetsky ever became a real football player. Yummy. Zajic himself recalls the moment Red Star Belgrade secured one of the bargains of the decade. In late May 1987, during one of our away trips to Zagreb, we stayed at the Hotel Esplanade, where I got approached by a man who introduced himself as Robert Prozhenetsky's uncle. He told me his nephew wasn't happy at Dynamo, and asked me if we could arrange a tryout. I told them to come to Belgrade in a few days, and they did. At the tryout, I saw this kid do wonders with the ball, and I immediately asked our head coach, Velibor Vasevich, to schedule an afternoon practice session at the main stadium, so that I could see the kid one more time. It was obvious we had a classy player on our hands, and I initiated the contract proceedings right away. Our lawyer informed us that we wouldn't have to pay a transfer fee to Dynamo, so Robert's father, Duro, and I agreed everything in five minutes. The then 18-year-old became a first-team regular under Vasovic, managing 23 league appearances as Red Star won the first league. A somewhat lanky, but incredibly gifted technical player, Brozhnetsky was quickly becoming the silky playmaker that benefited from an incredibly physical side around him. His passing and ability to take on his man proved invaluable, and the confidence in his play belied his youth. Being named Golden Boy, the best player of the tournament, on the way to winning the World Youth Championship, was a particular high point in such a flourishing young career, and it signalled to the Red Star hierarchy that they could afford to let go of Pixie for big money to the Galacticos of the day, Marseille. The irony of this will be pointed out in depth later. The young midfield of Prozhenetsky and Dejan Shasevichevich shone, despite a change in club management meaning no title in 1989. However, as Red Star entered the 90-91 season, Lupko Petrovic was appointed, and they made it immediately clear to Zajic that if they signed Sinisa Mihailovic from Vojvodina, they'd win the title. In the fourth year of their five-year plan, this seemed like too good a promise to turn down. Lupko Petrovic had been poached by the Red Star board after managing rivals Vojvodina to the title the season before. As mentioned, he brought Sinisa Mihailovic with him, and the rest is history. Well, there's a little bit more to it than that. Going from a summer of appointing a new manager to building the most ferocious counter-attacking side in Europe within months is no mean feat. So how was it done? Whilst it would be a great story to pin all this on Petrovic's tactical genius, there was clearly a fantastically talented squad at his disposal. Though, he obviously achieved more than anyone else that had managed the same playing staff. So how did he do it? Petrovic was renowned for his counter-attacking football, and it was felt that the raw physicality of the Red Star squad would suit that style. Bursts of pace and strength galore all over the pitch, recruitment had been impressive to say the least, and all that was needed was that final touch. Formation-wise, Red Star Belgrade of 1991 can be basically described as a 4-1-4-1, though there were so many more intricacies to it than that. It can be best described, really, as an early adaptation of the 4-2-3-1, but dropping into an asymmetric 5-3-2 when not in possession. Most likely, the best way to describe how Red Star played was captured by Walter Smith, scouting for Rangers ahead of their round of 16 European Cup tie. His report to manager Graham Souness was as follows. We're f And so they were. Let's go through things player by player. In goal, Stevan Stojanovic. A more than capable goalkeeper, Stojanovic was the freshly appointed team captain ahead of the 1991 season after Pixie's departure. His saves in the semi-final against Bayern Munich were key, as was his brick wall performance in the final itself. In defence, there were hard-working professionals in the form of Marovic, Sabanadzevic and Nidoski. But the real star was Mirdrag Belodic. Belodic was a Romanian sweeper born in Sokol near the Serbian border on the 20th of May 1964. According to Serbia's Tempo magazine, Mirdrag only spoke Serbian until he was in high school and eventually was aided in learning fluent Romanian by his youth team compatriot, a certain George Hadji. After signing with Stau Bucharest in 1982, he went on to quickly become a first-team player, 
racking up 174 appearances for the club until his departure in 1988. During this time, he was a key component of Stauer's 1986 European Cup win versus Barcelona, making them the first Eastern European side to win the competition. No doubt this experience helped guide Red Star through to glory in 1991. In 1988, though, his story takes a turn that wouldn't be a far-fetched movie plot. With a communist dictator in power in his home country of Romania, he fled to neighbouring Yugoslavia and came running to Red Star asking for a contract. It was given with glee, but developments got a bit messy. At that time, Romanian officials took control over their players' passports. It was the most extreme version of the Yugoslav rule that you couldn't leave to play abroad until you'd effectively passed your prime and Beladoric feared for his safety. The Yugoslavs told me there would be no problem giving me political asylum. I was afraid because I had a military rank. Every player from Stauer was in the army. Stauer Bucharest were an army-founded side, and were heavily tied to the nation's administration. Even the dictator's son was on the board. Due to his military rank, his fleeing to Yugoslavia meant that he was deemed a deserter, and subsequently was sentenced, in his absence, to a 10-year jail sentence. Asylum in Yugoslavia didn't go to plan either. Registration documents from the Romanian Football Association were fraudulent, and UEFA suspended him for 12 months as a result. His first season at Red Star would be spent away from the first team, only being allowed to play in unsanctioned friendly matches. Quite the drop-in standard for a shock European Cup winner. After the revolution in Romania in 1989, the charges were dropped and he was allowed to play professional football once again, much to Red Star's delight. As for the footballing side of his game, Mirdrag was a phenomenal libero. Sitting behind the back line and sweeping up through balls when out of possession, he was also more than capable at moving forward into midfield by carrying the ball with precision. As much as I wax lyrical about Prozinecki, Beladic was really a criminally underrated player. To be the defensive heartbeat of two different, huge shock European Cup winners, mastering a position that gained players like Beckenbauer, Mateus and Skreia lifelong legacies and awards, whereas the best Beladic could muster was 8th place in the 1991 Ballon d'Or voting. That deserves correction. To anyone uninformed on Liberos, there's some fantastic reading on the subject available, and I may even follow this up with a separate video on the lost position in the future. However, to put it simply, as the position doesn't exist in the modern game anymore, a libero could be seen as a centre-back that progressed the ball with playmaking skills, so think Ramos or Bonucci, or a playmaking midfielder that drops between centre-backs to pick up possession and restart moves from deeper than usual. Think Michael Carrick's last season for Man United, or Harry Kane for England. On to a midfield now that is packed full of talent and relative superstars. I can safely say that three of these players remain fond in my memory from watching Football Italia growing up on Channel 4, as they all had successful careers in the Serie A. Our first stop is the central midfield partnership of Vladimir Jugovic and Sinisa Mihailovic. Jugovic was a natural leader on the pitch, willing to play anywhere that his sides required him to. Used predominantly by Yugoslavia and Serbia as an inside forward on the left, he also found himself playing central midfield and sometimes even fullback. His willingness to give everything for the team has led to many in the footballing community naming him one of Serbia's greatest ever players. Following Jugovic is Sinisa Mihailovic, the player brought with Petrovic from Vojvodina. Playing either at left-back or central midfield, Mihailovic holds the record for most goals from free kicks in Serie A with 28 after spells in Italy with Roma, Sampdoria, Lazio and Inter. His description of the 1991 final is a particular highlight of mine. That final is still very vivid in my memory. I think it was the most boring final match of the European Cup history. A few hours before the match, seven of us were shown tapes with Olympique matches. I remember Lupko Petrovic telling us if we attack them, we'll leave ourselves open for counterattacks. To which I asked, So what do we do then? His answer was, When you get the ball, give it back to them. So we spent 120 minutes on the pitch without practically touching the ball. The match went to penalties, 
Manuel Amoros failed to convert his, whereas we all converted all five. Had we approached the match with attacking mentality, we probably would have lost. Not because Olympique were necessarily better than us, but because their players were used to playing big matches like this one. We had a squad full of 21, 22 and 23 year old kids. Next up in midfield is Prozhenetsky, but I think I've talked about him enough by now. In the further advanced midfield role is Dejan Savicevic, the man nicknamed the genius by AC Milan fans is widely regarded as one of the best players of his generation. Less romantic and more efficient than Prozhenitsky, he placed second in the Ballon d'Or voting of 1991, pioneering the free number 10 role in modern European football, and is in the AC Milan Hall of Fame after 21 goals in 97 appearances for the club. He now finds himself being the president of the Montenegrin Football Association. As for the forwards, we have ourselves another case of players being underrated. Whilst these players may not be deemed world-class in their own right, they still fit into the Red Star system better than anyone else, and that's hardly to be sniffed at. First up is Dragisa Binic, a man who possessed incredible speed. At the time of his playing peak, he could run 100 metres on grass in boots in 10.5 seconds, only 0.5 of a second off Carl Lewis's contemporary world record on track. His speed and agility led the Red Star counter-press, and Binic was a key component in both defending from the front and also providing an extra dimension to the already creative attack, especially domestically against lesser teams. Two spells at Red Star in 1988 and 1991 led to 13 and 14 goal seasons respectively from the right wing. Not the best technician, but an essential part of the tactical plan, and was an effective outball and pressing dimension to supplement the technical brilliance of the midfield supplying him. Up front and central was Darko Panchev. 84 goals in 91 league appearances over three seasons tells you all you need to know about his goal-scoring proficiency. Signed in 1988 from his home club in Macedonia, Red Star had recruited the most feared striker in the Yugoslav League, after 132 goals in 214 games for Vada, all before the age of 22. Panchev was a poacher very much in the Linica mould, a typical fox in the box. After he left Red Star, he faced heavy criticism from Inter Milan fans and players for his lack of effort. There are strikers who don't run, and there are strikers who run. I was one of those strikers with a natural talent for scoring, and I ran only when I was within 30 metres of goal. Unfortunately, Inter didn't want to accept that style of play. So, after such success, how come the majority of these players aren't household names? Why isn't the name Red Star Belgrade held in the same regard as major players like Manchester United, Barcelona or Inter Milan? Well, I'd love to say that the players just moved to greener pastures and the team suffered as a result. Nice and tidy ending. But that really wasn't the case. The European Cup win in 1991 was a huge final hurrah for Eastern European football, as only a month later, the cracks in Yugoslavia turned into tectonic gorges. Only a month after the European Cup victory, Slovenia and Croatia declared independence, and others quickly followed. I don't want to go into too many details, as I don't want to come across as preachy to younger viewers, nor do I want to insult or bring back terrible memories for anyone. But needless to say, the breakup of Yugoslavia brought some power-grabbing atrocities and war crimes to the region that initiated NATO military intervention and dominated early to mid-90s news coverage across the world. The players of Red Star didn't leave in search of better contracts off the base of their recent success, they left because their homeland was a literal war zone. Jugovic to Sampdoria. Belodoric to Valencia. Prozhenetsky to Real Madrid. Mihailovic to Roma. Panchev to Inter Milan. And Savicevic to AC Milan. In some cases, Red Star was still rewarded handsomely in transfer fees. But war continued until 1999 and even now there are still heavy political tensions between ex-Yugoslav states. 
it's hardly been a time for reinvestment. And even though domestic football had been ravaged, there was still hope for this golden generation to perform and were even declared heavy favourites for the 1992 European Championship, as the Red Star core would be joined by the likes of Davos Shuka and Pedro Mijatovic. But due to the war and UN sanctions, UEFA were pressured into expelling Yugoslavia from the competition only 10 days before its start. They were replaced by Denmark, who finished below them in qualifying, who then went on to win the competition in a massive shock of their own, launching the careers of Michael and Brian Laudrup and Peter Schmeichel into the stratosphere. What might have been. I really don't want to end this video on a morose note, so to demonstrate that Eastern European football still does hold a relevant legacy in the modern game, I thought I'd dabble into every history and football nerd's favourite hobby. What would a Yugoslavia team look like now? Croatia, as an independent nation, have led the charge for Eastern Europe on the international scene, constantly exceeding the expectations of a small nation, culminating in reaching the final of the last World Cup in 2018. Here's my own vision of what other nations could do in terms of strengthening. Oblak, Milenkovic Savic, Tadic, only a few names that would make this team in a 4-3-3 a terrifying proposition. Though, I'm sure that the majority of people in these nations value their independence higher than a slightly better football team. It still does go to show that even though these nations are still somewhat in recovery, the biggest sides from the old Yugoslav First League are still adhering to their philosophies of developing the best young talent they can. So can Red Star do it again? Probably not. Serbian football is somewhat a Eastern European mirror to Scotland. Red Star and Partizan to Rangers and Celtic. Scouts from teams with a lot more financial clout are sent there regularly, and anyone that shows promise is snatched up very quickly. Though sometimes too quickly. Luka Jovic, Marko Gorić, and Alexander Kolarov are all former Red Star youth graduates. Add to that list players like Nemanja Vidic, and it's clear that despite their political troubles, the club still retains the ability to generate world-class talent. The money in the game nowadays, as well as the constant restructuring of the Champions League to give more places to the big leagues, as opposed to champions of smaller ones, means that the likelihood of a team like Red Star ever winning a European title again without significant artificial investment is slim to none. But the story of Red Star in 1991 serves as nostalgic romanticism for football fans everywhere that there are talent hotbeds outside of Brazil, Spain and Germany, and that everyone loves an underdog. Thank you for watching the whole 18 yards. It's been a real pleasure to put this together, and I hope you'll join me for more videos every fortnight, Saturday at 3pm. In the meantime, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video, so you can keep up to date with new releases. Goodbye for now.